everybody. It is a great pleasure to introduce today to Juan Esteban Saavedra. He's an associate economist working right now at Brand, and he was previously a professor at Los Angeles University at the School of Government. He had his PhD at Harvard uh, from the Public Policy School. He also has an MPA and an MA and a BA from Columbia Economics at the University uh, of Los Angeles. So he has quite a series which is looking at the long-term effects of, of vouchers for private secondary school in Colombia. Um, so just to give you a sense of why we care about this question, there's a lot of debate and widespread belief in some sense that private schools offer a better education than public schools. Okay? And this is particularly true, at least they believe, in developing countries because public service provision is usually very weak. And, and you know the fact that the, this you know there's this wide widespread belief uh, motivates the use of demand side interventions such as vouchers to um, finance and increase private school enrollment. Okay, and so so the thing is that all these claims about the relative benefits of private versus public schooling have been widely tested and contested. And so we don't really have much of a good evidence. Um, on whether this is actually the case or not. And so to give you a sense, um, I'm here just citing the, the, the evidence from, from um, school vouchers, because there's you know, a wider literature looking at private, for example, there's a big literature on Catholic schools that I'm just like leaving aside. Uh, but the most relevant literature on whether school vouchers have, students that receive uh, vouchers to attend a private school have uh, positive academic achievement gains or educational attainment gains is fairly mixed and so we have evidence from from Colombia and in the US there's evidence from a small program in, in Washington DC the, 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 the DC scholarship program there's evidence from Milwaukee there's a few voucher studies but but if you put the evidence together it's it's really very mixed so for example we have effects on uh, on grade progression graduation and scores that are positive and large in Colombia. Um, there's some evidence of um, ne even negative effects in the US context, sometimes zero effects on achievement, and there's some evidence suggestive of, of positive hi uh, high school graduation effects, for example, in the DC budget, budget choice uh, scholarship program. And so, so the question is really like two things. One is, what do we think is the effect of these programs on longer term outcomes? And as, as this is important because there is a lot of literature that documents that, that uh, effects of early childhood interventions, for example, fade out during uh, elementary and middle school, and then you see big effects again in adult outcomes. There's a recent literature by, by colleagues of mine at Harvard University, um, Raj Chetty and, and uh, John Friedman, for example, and they've, they've looked at uh, the assignment of teachers to children in kindergarten in the, in the Tennessee Star Experiment, and they know they, 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 the first thing they observe is that the, the, the test score effects that you see in the first two years of after the intervention fade out in the third, fourth, and fifth year. And then you see very large labor market effects and collegiate attendance effects. And so, so putting together the evidence of achievement with educational attainment and labor market outcomes is usually not straightforward. So, for example, if you focus policies or try to implement programs based on achievement effects or the lack thereof, they, these policies could be potentially misleading. And the other reason for why looking at long-term outcomes is important is because it's usually, when you think about doing cost-benefit calculations of, of different policy interventions, when they're based on achievement, usually you have to do some elaborate assumption about how does, for example, a point to standard deviation increase in test scores translate into something that we really care about, okay? Whereas if you do, if, if you're able to look, for example, at labor market outcomes, you know, you can, you can use the measure of, of for example, a, a wage increase as a, as a measure of the private benefit or even the social benefit of, of a program. And then uh, cost-benefit calculations are more straightforward, which is 
um, where I hope to get at the end of this talk. So, so specifically, we address we address three questions in this paper. The first is what are the effects of private school vouchers on collegiate outcomes? So, by collegiate outcomes, I mean college enrollment, persistence, um, choice of, uh, for example, two versus four year college, choice of uh, major, and so forth. And then, um, what are the, the effects of private school vouchers on labor market outcomes? 15 years after voucher receipt. So we're going to look at a cohort of applicants that applied for the voucher in 1995. And we're going to track them in 2010. Okay? And we're going to observe their earnings, whether they, how much weeks have they worked in the formal sector in a given year. And we have the trajectory of labor market performance for, for uh, I guess, five or six years. And I'm going to show you some evidence on the impacts on, on, on that margin. and. Uh, and, uh, and on the sector of occupation. And then um, using, using the, the information from their uh, labor market performance between voucher winners and losers, uh, we're going to do some um, private and social benefit calculations. And if I have time at the end of the talk, I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about the potential mediating mechanisms. And so this last question is important because the debate about whether the benefits of vouchers are positive or not, you know, even if they, even if people agree that in some countries they're positive, there's still a lot of controversy about why they're positive. And some people argue that the reason why they're positive is simply because there's peer effects in private schools. And so all you're doing is you're redistributing some students from a set of schools with low peers into a into a set of schools with high peers. And so if the effect is just redistributive then, uh, as economists like to say, the partial versus general equilibrium effects of this policy are very different. In other words, the effects of a small scale program cannot be extrapolated to a general policy. And so that's problematic because if we think that these programs could be effective at a small scale, then the scope for expansion and scale up is very limited. Okay? So, so in, a, in a previous paper uh, with my colleagues, we investigated some of this and so I, if, if time we can talk a little bit about that. So, so just to give you a, a sense, we use administrative data from Colombia. Uh, the way to think about this in the US context for those that are not familiar with, with the Colombia context is, is kind of like national student clearinghouse data for collegiate outcomes and social security records for, for labor market outcomes. Okay? And so we find that winning a voucher increases uh, college access by 10% and college persistence by about 25%. It doubles the likelihood that a student receives government financial aid to attend college. Um, increases monthly earnings by about 10%. And we find that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the collegiate and labor market outcomes, specifically focused on men. The, the labor market outcomes we find of uh, winning a voucher are concentrated mostly on, on, on men, male applicants. Um, um, so yeah. did you do any tests for socioeconomic status in future any redistribution? So that's, that's a good point. Uh, these vouchers were targeted to low-income students only. And so, so, uh, so all the applicants were strata one or strata two, which is, which is a measure of socioeconomic status in Colombia based on where you live. So one or two is the lowest. And you know, one of the things we looked at is whether, whether the probability of being categorized in CISBEN, which is kind of like a means test to receive social benefits, was different between voucher winners and losers 15 years afterwards, and we didn't find anything. Okay. So, so please feel free to interrupt me at any point with questions or, or comments. Um, just more fun for everyone. <laughs> to me. Um, and so um, we're going to claim that this effect we observe here are likely a productivity effect. That is, it's the reason why we see that the earnings are higher is not because voucher winners have more experience or because they're working in roughly different sectors of the economy. Uh, or more hours. It's just that they that, that they are, you know, like their marginal productivity is higher because we see similar sector employment distributions and no difference in the number of working days per year between winners and losers. Okay. And so if you take those labor market numbers and take into account the cost of the program to the government and to families, because because as I'm going to mention, families topped up the value of the voucher to attend certain private schools. 
uh, then we find that the program um, was very cost effective. So the benefit cost ratio per voucher winner was about seven to one. Okay, so if the government shells out one dollar for this voucher, it gets in return from a social perspective about seven. So it pays for itself in orders of magnitude. Okay. So um, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of context of this program. Because this program, the way it started, in the US usually when you think about voucher programs, voucher programs are put in place basically to improve the quality of education for underdeserved populations. That's for example the case in the DC voucher program, that has been the case in the you know, New York and data voucher programs, which are other um, somewhat fairly studied uh, voucher initiatives. Um, but in Colombia, the reason why they introduced the voucher program was not really to improve quality. It was a problem of access. It happened that in the early 1990s, say you were a student finishing elementary school in a public school. Okay, so you're in fifth grade, you're in a public school, and then you want to continue on to secondary school in a public school. Well, it turns out you didn't have enough slots. So you did, you did not have a guarantee slot in public school to go on to secondary school in a public school. But if you put together all the slots in public schools and all the slots in private schools, there was enough capacity to attend all the excess demand coming out of the elementary public school system. Okay? So what the government did was, well, imagine you're the Minister of Education, for example. You can say, well, um, I could build more schools. So, you know, that's an alternative. Just create more infrastructure and hire more teachers and make those schools public. Or I could use the already existing private infrastructure and send some of these kids to the private system. And yeah. When, uh, so when the kids were distributed to the private schools, they can, can we say that the quality of those those schools were higher as measured by? Um, I'll I'll I'll, okay. I'll give you a sense. Uh, the answer is no. Um, yeah, because because the, the the participating schools were were not the elite private private schools that you're thinking about. It was small um, private schools that looked in in terms of of observable characteristics, very comparable to public schools. So, so we really don't see that being the driver of, of, the, college, of, the, of the school improvement dimension that, that um, one would expect. Um, okay, and, and so in some other ways, it was, this was also created to, to, to sort of like to incentivize a little bit of competition with the public sector and strengthen the private provision of schools in the country. So it turns out that this program, in retrospect, has been one of the largest voucher programs in the world. Okay? During the 90s, it awarded about 125,000 vouchers over the span of about seven years. To give you a sense, um, the, the DC voucher program that has been in place since 2006 roughly awards um, 1,800 vouchers a year. So over over like about five years, it's awarded about you know eight to nine thousand vouchers. What about Chile? Okay, so that's the other big program, and Chile, Chile is an, has a national voucher program. Okay, and and I'll talk when when we talk about these mechanisms, I'll, I'll actually emphasize a lot in the, in the Chile case, because Chile, unlike Colombia, anyone can use the voucher, rich or poor kids. Okay. In the Colombia, vouchers were targeted, and that's going to be a key difference. Okay. Because, because what you observe in Chile is that on aggregate, there's no achievement gains, but there's a huge segregation by socioeconomic status between public and private schools, because only the rich kids use the voucher. Okay? And so when we think about scaling up, you know, that's, one of, that's going to be one of the dimensions that, that we must take into account. Um, okay, so, I mean, it's a lot of, no, it's a lot of vouchers, um, in absolute number, even relative to the voucher programs in the U.S., but it's about only 5% of total secondary enrollment um, in Colombia at the time. And the vouchers were targeted to low-income students, so the definition of low-income student there is you live in a neighborhood that's where, where mostly poor people live. Okay? And, and so the way, the way you would certify that was you had to show up, um, when, you, when you wanted to sign up for a voucher, you had to show up with a utility bill electricity or water bill that showed that you live in a strata one or two out of six possible. Okay? And so 
Um, the, other, the, the other condition were that applicants had to be enrolled in a public elementary school at the time they applied, be at least, uh, at most 15, and had to be accepted at a private participating school. So this is actually an important feature of this program because in most programs in the US, in all programs in the US actually, what happens is, for example, in the, in the DC program or in New York, where, where they've had this lottery system, you apply for the lottery, and then if you win the lottery, then you go shopping for schools, okay? In Colombia, it was the other way around. You had to, ex ante, had to look for a school, be accepted at a school, uh, at a private participating school, and then know the status of the lottery. And in practice, it was hard to change which school you went to afterwards, okay? And so that feature, for example, is what allows us to, to get a sense of, of what's the possible mediating mechanism, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So in the US, like, kids, it's also basically needed because the kids tend to go to the public school in the neighborhood, and we know that better yeah. schools tend to be in better neighborhoods. So in Colombia, at least in Bogota, I don't know the rest of the country, you would take, like, the bus. So that means that families were more willing to go to schools that were further away from their home? So, um, there were, so there were two things. There were lots of private schools in, in near where, where these kids used to live. And, and one response of this program, because there, there was this sort of like cash on the table that schools could use if they received enough um, you know, voucher students, uh, a lot of, you, you would see that there were lots of schools that opened during this time to attend this, this potential demand. That weren't necessarily the best quality of schools. When the program stopped, some of these schools had to, had to stop functioning because they did not have the cash flow to subsist because the, 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 most of the money was coming from the voucher program. Okay. But how do students apply to the program? Okay, so that's a good question. It, it's certainly over 125,000, but um, I'll, I'll get to that in the next slide. Okay. Because it's, it's actually a, a little bit, it's not, the program was not managed centrally. Each, each um, well, Give me one slide and I'll get to that point in detail. Okay. So all private schools could participate. If you were a private school principal, you could say, well, I want to be part of this program. And, and it's actually, that's, that's very similar to other voucher programs around the world in the US. So you know, private schools, for example, in DC say, okay, for this program I have 25 slots in eighth grade, 40 slots in ninth grade, and so on and so forth. Okay. And so, the thing is that, as Tatiana was mentioning, the private participating schools were cheaper than the typical private schools. It wasn't the elite schools that took part in the program. And there was an over-representation of vocational schools, which have, are of you know, lower status, if you will. Um, but the private participating schools had resources and tests were similar to public schools and lower than non-participating private schools. Okay, so they looked roughly comparable to the public schools in the cities where they were. The and the vouchers were renewed automatically until the end of high school. Only if recipients did not fail grades, okay, so there was an uh, you know like an academic incentive attached to them. Um, and so and so this is uh, the, the previous question. The thing the thing is, each city, each year, determined how many vouchers they were going to award. Okay, based on budgetary constraints. And so they said, okay. For this year, for this cohort, I have a thousand vouchers. And say you had two thousand applicants, then in that situation, they would give the vouchers by lottery. But there were some other cohorts in some other cities where the the demand of vouchers was smaller than than the, the available supply of vouchers, and so they would just give it to everyone who had applied. And so that's why I say that the, the number of applicants was at least higher, as one hundred and twenty-five thousand. Because in many contexts, the vouchers were awarded by lottery, and so we're going to take advantage of the fact that there was randomization to look at the, at the effect of the voucher on the long term outcomes. Okay. So, but given that it's not across the country that randomization only applies to specific regions or cities? Yes, so, so I'll, I'll show you some numbers in a little bit. Uh, and so there is variation across space and over time in awarded vouchers. And so, so I think if, you know, the other day um, at, uh, at the SHRI conference, um, that, uh, that was in New York a couple of weeks ago. Um, Howard Bloom gave a, an amazing presentation on how to analyze treatment effect heterogeneity. 
and he used the fact that, it, that some program of, of welfare to work transition had multiple sites. And so it occurred to me that um, you know, a phenomenal PhD dissertation would be to collect data from all the cities and all the cohorts um, where this program had taken place and analyze the heterogeneity and try to explain what would make, um, you know, what, what, why would you see, why would you see certain different effects. We're only going to use a few cohorts that we already have the data for in, in the previous project, but anyway, that's just an idea that I thought. And so, um, and so when, when, when there were more and more applicants than, than the available slots, they were assigned by, by a lot. Okay? So this is the data that we're going to use. So this is the, the, the first paper of the series in which I was not involved, but, uh, but it was through this paper that I got involved because my colleagues, Eric, Eric Pettinger and Michael Kramer, um, worked in it. Although, usually, if I press anger, you get all the credit. But, but this is... <laughs> They've actually documented that, like, you know, the economists that have letters closer to A are more famous than the economists that have letters <laughs> closer to closer to like, the end of the alphabet because of the lexicographic way of of citing, even though they like potentially could have contributed the same, if not more. Or more. Hey, I'm married to a So, so for example, let's look at this course. So, this is, these are three cores that they used in this in this first paper. For example, in the Bogota 1995 cohort, there were 4,044 applicants, okay? Of which, only 58% got a voucher. But you see that the award rates vary depending on, on, on which cohort and which year you had applied. In the same city, two years later, they, they uh, awarded 84% of, of on voucher. Because there were, there, you know, the relationship between applicants and slots was, was much lower, okay? And in the city, they gave 50%. So you had that variation in the probability of winning a voucher depending on the city and uh, the program that you had applied to, okay? And so what my colleagues had, sh had shown before is that there's a lot of balance between applicant winners and applicant losers, as you would have expected from a randomization that works well. So for example, the way this table is constructed, and it's gonna be roughly the structure that we're gonna follow in, in, in the uh, and labor market outcomes tables is the first column shows the, the mean for the control group, okay? And the second column shows the coefficient on a regression where you regress the outcome on a dummy for winning or, or, or not winning the voucher. So it gives you the difference between the two groups and then the number in parentheses is basically the standard error of that difference. And so what you can see from this, from this table is that you know, the differences are very small, and for, you know, for the most part, for all the cohorts, if you pull them all together, they're, they're statistically significant with the, with the exception of um, age of the time of application. So voucher winners tended to be slightly younger than voucher losers. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's true in, I mean, it's significant or marginally significant in all the settings. Yeah, setting. yeah. Was there something in the... And that can't just be a coincidence. No, I don't think. I don't think it was. It was just random. Uh, I mean, it could be. It could be like, you know, random as one as one characteristic. But, but it. But it's. It's fairly systematic across the whole. So. Um, so that's that. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna track this cohort of applicants over 15 years. Okay? And the reason why we choose this one is, is two. First of all, this one, um, you know, did really like, this is a small town near Cali, and so you know, like we we were doubtful that this would have any sort of like bite in terms of collegiate outcomes or something like that. And then here, we the proportion of voucher winners versus voucher losers was not, you know, well balanced. And so um, for those of you who have, you know, like. Like looked at this in detail, or have you know, like studied um, randomization or experimentation, you you probably would have learned that you know, given an effect size, you're much more likely to detect that effect size if the comp in the combination of the two groups between treatment and control is roughly 50. So so that's just why why we focus on this one, and and the final reason is because you know it's it's the oldest of the core, so it gives us you know, 
the, the most time span available to look at long term. Um, okay, this is where things, this is the easy part. Then we get into the difficult part. Uh, and Tatiana will, will know a little bit about this from knowing the Columbia context. Which is, it's not straightforward to trap people over time in Colombia because when you're born, this has changed in the last couple of years, but, but it hadn't changed um, when, when we were looking at these applicants. Say Tatiana is born, and you know, like when she's born, she gets an identity, a national identification number that's called Tarjeta Identidad. And so that's an identification number for everyone in the country until they're 18 years of age. Okay? But when you become 18, basically, you obtained the adult identification number, which is called a cedula. And so that means that from you know, a research point of view, people get lost. Because you know, it might coincide with changing names and so forth. And so because most of the applicants, when they were surveyed, they were around 15 years of age, they were, all of them had the tarjeta identification number. But if you want to look at them in social security records at age 28, or 30, they're going to show up with a cedula. And so, and so we had a missing link there. And, and so, have the same last name, so you cannot, you cannot claim Yeah, so we had, we had, yeah, exactly. So then, then we're like, <laughs> then we're like trying to match people on, and so that, that was just, that was just a mess. So, so for about four years, we were, we worked with the, the National Register to do a crosswalk between, because they have, they have the, the, the roster of people's names, date, dates of birth, tarjeta uh, identidad, and, and the cedula numbers. And we gave them this, um, this applicant list of, of 4,000 applicants with their name, cedula, tarjeta identidad, date of birth, and they gave us, they retrieved cedula numbers for us. And, and we were lucky enough that that happened before. They passed a law, um, which you know, Tatiana and I fairly well because we were trying to obtain data like this for another project and it has been impossible because because for confidentiality reasons they don't give this information. So we basically were lucky on that front and we were able to match with cedular numbers about 75% of the applicants in our sample and importantly we didn't find any difference between voucher winners and losers and the probability of having a valid cedular number. So a valid cedular number means you know the right band and okay. So, so that's, so that's it. And so then with the cedula, then we could look at, we could look into, you know, the National Clearing House and Social Security equivalent records in the world. Okay? Um, this is what I just told you. So, is there any so difference in, uh, in pre, like pre-test characteristics between people you could find a cedula number four versus people you couldn't find? So you're saying if the predictors of, of having a cedula number were different between So, so one country, yeah, that's no, right. But, no, it's more of a generalizability question. The question is, are this uh, people okay. that you could find the cedular numbers for, do they look like um, everyone else? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, that's, that's a good question. Okay. Yeah. My sense is that no, because of the high, very high match rate, but, right. but, uh, but I, the, answer, the answer is I don't know. Um, okay. So, so the first batch of data, which is to look at college outcomes, um, comes from this data set called Spadias, which means something about you know, the likelihood of dropping out. It was designed to track people's dropout and, and, and persistent status through college. It has very good reporting. It's an individual level kind of data tracking freshmen through college pathways. So it started working in 1998, and, and we used the cutoff data of 2009. It has about 95% coverage of the post-secondary population in Colombia. Uh, they follow students with cedula names, that's why it was important for us to get the cedula numbers. And so, um, there's about 2% of individuals that get lost because they will encourage with the tarjeta and the school does not update their information. So, so the coverage is pretty good. Yeah. Also, since students tend to go to the same university that must be located in Bogota, that makes your life much easier. Yeah, because the reporting there is, is probably better than, than in the other place. And so we, we get coverage in all except military universities, which is about 3% of enrollment. 
and universities report data at least twice per year in the spring and in the fall. Okay? Uh, there is some heterogeneity in the quality of reporting, but we don't find difference between voucher wins and voucher losses in the probability of conditional ongoing, but you see that, that might be affected ongoing to a good quality versus bad quality reporting. Okay? So, so what sort of information can we get from that data set? Uh, well, they identifying information that we used to match. What, when did they enroll the freshman university freshman program? Whether it's a presential versus distance program? Are they currently enrolled? Have they dropped out? Have they graduated? Um, what type of financial aid have they received? Have they received financial aid from the government? Um, so, okay. so, um, and so for this, we used a matching algorithm that combines. We didn't do exact matching. We used a matching algorithm combining central numbers. And, uh, and names, and then we validated that subsample with exact ID and names, and basically verified that that for that subsample we had got you know, basically no type type one errors. And then for for the other for the labor market outcomes data, we um, use what's called the Integrated Information System of Social Protection, which is a data warehouse that has. Um, data on all key processes of social protection in Colombia. So we have data on, on their health, work, which is what we're going to focus on, pension coverage, disability coverage, social assistance. This is an individual level panel data set updated monthly. Uh, it has the universe of work module covers all former sector employments. And that's, that's, that was uh, to us initially a potential concern because informality in Colombia is very big. About half of all the working age population works in the informal sector. And so if, for example, we, we find that the probability of being in, being working in the formal sector is different between winners and losers, then we know that you know, whatever labor market outcome effect we document is not causal because it's mediated by, by the fact that um, you know, there's a difference in the likelihood of being working in the formal, which is the formal sector. Um, and then for this one, so the way this works, this works is they, obviously they didn't give us the data. We had to like give them a list with the names, the cellular numbers, um, and, and uh, the type of document, so cellular, for example, to the Ministry of Social Protection. We gave it to them, and then they returned the matched data to us. Okay? And then, and then so, so what the ministry does is they batch initially on cellular, and then they take the two names, the, of, of, of the person in the in the in their records and in our records and then validate that it's the same person. So this is just to give you a sense of, of the work module. I mean, if, if you if you had one, uh, if you were affiliated, this is you could actually go into the, into the into the record system and like and you know get your information. So this is when I was when I was in Colombia. I was working at Los Andes University. You type in your cellula number. Uh, this is my number. Okay, and then it, 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 it brings out your schedule, your full name, your gender, uh, and then whether you're affiliated in the, you know, like health health contribution, which company are you affiliated in, when did you start, are you active, uh, are you the principal beneficiary, or or is this your spouse or your son or someone else, are you affiliated to pensions, blah blah blah, professional, uh, I don't know what the translation of professional basis are, uh, disability insurance. I guess. Then, um, and then it would give information of you know, a bunch of stuff. Okay. So, so it's a it's a pretty rich data set, and we have that panel of data for for about six years, from 2006 to 2011. So, so moving on to results. So this table is showing you in the same format. Yeah. Uh, we have two year colleges, and this technology. Yeah. I'll, I'll show I'll show you that. Uh, um, there's no difference between about you when you're sending to the code that you're from going to your college versus what you're college, as you can see here. But essentially, we, 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 we see that about 21% of applicants from the 1995 Bogota cohort ever enroll in college. Okay? So you might think that that's a big number or a small number. One way to put it in perspective is to um, you know, compare it to the likelihood of, of um, of the voucher applicants to graduate from high school, okay? And so it turns out that my, my colleagues analyzed the high school graduation margin, and they found out that uh, about 
of uh, voucher applicants ever graduated from high school about in about 2001. So, so this means that, first of all, a lot of people drop out of high school, but of the ones that are like, I mean, this is not conditional of graduating from high school because then it wouldn't be causal, but if you wanted to like just get a rough sense, about two thirds of the fraction that graduate from high school end up, end up attending college at some point, okay? And voucher winners are slightly more likely to, to ever enroll. Um, it's slightly sensitive to which controls you include, but, um, but it's, it's there. Um, no difference in the probability of enrolling in college. And, and you know, the point estimate is very small, so, so it's not that it's just an imprecisely estimated zero. Um, very large effect in the probability of being currently enrolled or have graduated. So this is our measure of persistence. Um, so about 9% of, of voucher applicants are currently enrolled or have already graduated from college. And the likelihood is about three percentage points higher. So about 33% higher for voucher winners than losers. It's, it's not sensitive to which controls you include. No difference in the probability of enrolling in a distance learning program. Um, this is important. They're much more likely, voucher winners are much more likely than losers, you know, twice as likely as losers to receive financial aid from the government. And so this is, there, there's two reasons for why this is the case, we think. Um, the first reason is that government financial aid is, is both need and, and merit based. So all of the applicants meet the need base, right? Because they're the, 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 the vouchers are focusing on, on low income students. But what, what my colleagues had found in, the, in their previous paper was that voucher winners were much more, more likely to get higher scores in the college entry exam, which is the other dimension of, um, of eligibility for college loans. And so, so we think that part of this effect is driven by the fact that they have better college entry tests, like we will be the equivalent of an SAT test than, than uh, voucher losers. Why and try to understand what happened because if, if what what we know is the quality of the high schools that these kids ended up attending yeah. is basically the same. Yeah. So what what happened? I'll, I'll get I'll get there. That's that's all the mechanism story. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and, and it's it's uh, it's uh, it's an important question. But uh, but let me defer that question um, to the end if that's okay. Okay. And then and then this is this is similar to the difference that that Morgan had pointed out, you know, that the, the voucher winners are, are, when they take the college entry test, they're, they're younger, okay? And so, so this has to do with the fact that the program, I mean, it doesn't explain the difference at, at the onset, but what happens is, because the, the, the voucher was tied to not failing ever a grade, um, voucher winners were less likely to repeat or fail grades than voucher losers, and it means that when they, when they got to the time of taking the college entry exam, they were slightly younger. Uh, but, but you know, importantly, what, what we find is that the effects are concentrated. The persistence effect, in particular, is concentrated in in ma male applicants. So we see no effect in, on women, and it's all, all concentrated on men, for whom the effect of persist the, 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 the college <coughs> persistence effect is about is about fifty percent. And we see a difference in the probability of being enrolled in a distance learning program. So women are more likely to be enrolled in a distance learning program, perhaps because they're rearing children, and it's an important hypothesis that we're trying to investigate um, whether there was a different, well, obviously differential impact on, on, on pregnancy and, and you know, like, you know, career versus family. So, um, okay. And then, then we also see that the effect on, on, on receiving governmental financial aid is again all focused on, on the main applicants. What, uh, yeah. what type of financial aid was available at the time because access was not? No, it wasn't access. Yeah. It was it was one of the other programs that were targeted to 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 low income, uh, high achieving students. Yeah, same conditionality as access, but not the access program. Okay, and so this this is the results from the from the labor market outcomes data. Uh, this results is basically pulling together all the data from the six years, kind of like in a, what, what we call a seemingly unrelated regression framework, um, and clustering standard errors at the person level. Because for each person we have 
up to up to five years, so 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, and 2011 data, up to six years of data. Okay, so we're going to put together all their their uh, earnings observations, all their formal employment versus not observations, and then and then because we have multiple observations for the same person, uh, we want to like take into account that into the into the adjustment of the standard errors, and then um, what you see first of all is that there's no difference in the probability of ever having to work in the formal sector. Okay? So about 94% of voucher losers have worked in the, for in, in the formal sector, and no difference between um, winners and losers. You can see that this coefficient is very small, a tenth of a, of a percentage point, and no difference between uh, male and female. That's important because, as I mentioned, all the earnings outcomes that we're going to look at are conditional on being in the formal sector. So this is saying you know, there's no difference in the probability of working in the formal sector. Um, no differences in the likelihood of, uh, of uh, sorry, the number of days that you have worked in the formal sector. So it's possible that some people work in the formal sector. This, you know, like the same, the same, the probability is the same, but some work for a longer period than others. So, so, so it's possible, for example, that voucher winners and voucher losers enter the formal sector, say, in January, but but your winners are more likely to stay longer in the formal sector, and that will be an important outcome to analyze. And so what this is showing you is that that is not the case. So on average, voucher losers spend about 38 days, 37 days, of, on average, in a year working in the formal sector. That's about seven to eight months of formal employment. And no difference uh, between voucher winners and losers, these coefficients. You know, in terms of magnitude, are very small and, and, and are also uh, not statistically significant. Two, three days plus or minus. Okay, uh, but then we see a big impact on on earnings. So the average monthly contribution for health, which is basically the the income that you declare um, uh, on which your your health benefits is is based upon, on average is three thousand and seventy-eight. Uh, 378,000 pesos, which is approximately $200 per month. Um, this is a little bit over over minimum wage, monthly minimum wage in Colombia. And voucher winners are, are you know, have, have earnings that are about you know, eight to ten percent larger. Again, higher if you focus on men. Okay, and this is just showing you now breaking the difference year by year before it was all stuck together and this is breaking the difference year by year so so they start a little bit higher in the first year statistically significant but you can see that the gap gets a little bigger every year okay? so even though they start a little higher it keeps getting higher as they as they move out in in their in their you know like in, in the, into their employment um, so so this figure is this figure is quite nice here there's a little bit of a taper off, um, but I mean, it very well be flat, so, so we don't make too much of that kind of, um, uh, reduction in the, just in the last year. And so this is showing you the distribution of occupation into different occupation categories. We, we didn't do this, is, if, if you were going to do this in the United States, it's roughly using what we call one digit industry codes. Because if we do two or three digit industry codes, then cell sizes get minuscule and then it's hard to see anything. Um, so roughly speaking, I mean like one, one comment that, that, that uh, I got last week is, well, you know, like it could be the case that this person is working, for example, in transportation, or communication, and financial intermediation services, but you know, the voucher winner is working in, in as an assistant clerk in a financial intermediation company where the rest of the other person is a driver, and you wouldn't be able to tell, and, and that's a fair enough comment. Uh, we're thinking of ways to refine this a little bit by by um, doing sort of uh, wage premiums attached to occupations and then regress the wage premium whether you win or not a, a, a lottery. But, but for that, we need to get survey data um, tied to occupational status. And, and we, this, was, this just happened last week, so, so we haven't been able to do that. Uh, but for what it's worth, um, the distribution of occupations between voucher winners looks roughly comparable to that of voucher losers in aggregate. So, um, okay, so what do we make of all this? 
So let's think about the cost of the program first. The government, and so this is all in, in today's dollars, or in last year's dollars. So the additional government expenditure per voucher winner per year was about $32. That's what the government put up front for, for each participant in each year. And each household had to also put up some money because the voucher, although initially covered 100% of the cost of attending private schools, the government did, did not update that amount. And so by the third year, it roughly only covered 50%. And so we basically calculated based on, on, on survey data that uh, that vouchers, voucher families had to put up almost like, um, the, I mean, roughly the same amount as, as the government had put in the first place, $25, okay? So, so the cost of enrolling in a public school was $57 a year? The cost of enrolling in a public school? In a school, private school. In a private school, uh, yeah, this was monthly. Monthly, yeah. I mean, no, sorry, this is, no, this is yearly, yeah, this is yearly. Okay. In today's dollars, yeah. What's GDP per capita? 2,600. Okay, so it's about 20 times, so it's like 40,000. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's like 20 times. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So then the total direct cost per voucher winner per year is, well, the sum of these two. But we have to, when we take into account the cost, we have to take into account the waste that the government and families induce because, because especially in the first year, for example, only 88% of voucher winners took up, took up the voucher, okay? Uh, and then only 40% of voucher users ever graduated from high school. So it means that if we want to like quantify how much it costs, for example, to obtain, potentially, the labor market benefits, we have to account that like, even though we give the vouchers for students to attend six years of secondary schooling, many, many won't like use it for the whole time. And so, so that's why we obtain an upper bound of the cost, which is at the same, you know, like there's no return or there's no benefit for those that don't use the voucher during the entirety of their secondary six years of school. Okay? Yeah. Do you see any indication of significant changes in the households that apply for the voucher after as it got reduced from 100% to 50 over the three years? That's a, that's a very good question. We only had a cross-section three years after they received, the, after they received uh, the lottery, so the 1995 applicants. We surveyed in 1998, and so, so we, we couldn't really like follow over time the changes in household patterns, but it would have been really interesting. One, but that's also problematic because if you think about it, like basically we had a free education and now we are asking people to put half of the money so the people who are willing to put half of the money is kind of a selected sample. So well, it's it's a selected sample um, in, 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 in what sense? It, there's no difference between, I mean, in terms of exantic characteristics, it's, it's likely the same people as the voucher losers, right? Because but we lose people through the program. Because we have the people who didn't take it. Then yeah. we have the people who went So there's 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 then imperfect compliance, that's right. Exactly. But but so maybe maybe it's useful to think about it this way. If you look at three years after the program, after after the voucher was initially awarded in nineteen ninety five, the difference in the probability of attending private schools between say someone who won the voucher and someone who didn't is not one. It's about fifty percent. So many voucher losers ended up going to, up to private school. Part of the reason is they had to apply and be accepted at a private school in order to participate in the lottery, okay? So what this is telling you is that, you know, like private families, uh, so at least in the, in, the, in the applicant sample that we looked at, all these families were willing, in some sense, to incur the cost of attending private school. Okay. But all of your estimates are to treat. All of them yeah. are intent to treat, yeah. Which is what the lottery buys. We haven't done any adjustment because because it depends what you know what what effect would you like to recover? Would you like to recover the effect of ever winning a scholarship to go to private school? Would you like to recover the effect of ever attending private school or attending private school for X years? And so 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 we don't like you know wet too much to any of, of these like 
treatment untreated because because it would depend, you know, like, like the denominator to adjust the, the intent to treat would be different depending on what's the margin, and the exclusion or exclusion, of course, would be different depending on what's the what's the treatment untreated that would, you would like to get from that. So, I mean, if anything, this is this is like a you know like it's it's a watered down treatment untreated effect. It's just an intent to treat. So that's that's. A good one. Did you ever look at the? Who didn't take up the voucher after they were awarded one? Like, who, who is that 12% of patients that didn't take up the voucher? Um, uh, I don't know. I don't remember, is the answer. Um, you think, so, so you're thinking they might be different from the ones that... Um, I don't know. I mean, if, if they have to pay, like, let's say, in the second or third year, it very well could be the case. I mean, you, you, in many cases, you see that that, that in, in, in programs with imperfect compliance, the compliers and the and the never takers are are different. So that's um, that's a valid question. So so th does that address your question of like you know even some some control or or voucher loser families ended up going into private school suggesting and because of the rules of the program, you know they had to like. There, there was like a revealed preference for going to private school, right? So, so in terms of generalizability, you might want to think about, but this is also the case in, um, you know, in, in, in many voucher programs where you have to apply for the voucher in order to get it. So, so unlike, you know, unlike, unlike in the Columbia program, you had to like, in Columbia, you had to be accepted and apply to the private school you wanted to go and be accepted before you uh, knew the status of the voucher. So that's, that was a distinctive feature of, of, of this program, and that's why you see that a, a high fraction of control group families end up going to private school. Okay. And so this gives you an upper bound of about um, of about six uh, sorry six hundred and eighty nine dollars. And so if we take the additional uh, monthly earnings, which is about thirty one, if you put that earnings differential. To today's dollars. That means that if you assume only eight months of formal employment through the year and no informal employment, which is you know roughly what we see in terms of formal employment, that means 244 um, dollars per year, um, which discounted over a 35-year horizon at a three or four percent discount rate. It doesn't matter. Um, gives you about five thousand dollars, which means that. Um, the benefit to cost ratio is about six or seven to one. Okay? So very good investment from a social perspective. And that, that's not even taking into account the opportunity cost of attending a public school. So also the government has to pay for the public school slot. You know, we haven't factored that in and we haven't factored in potential externalities related to crime and etc. Et et okay. Um, okay. So, so why do we think we see these differences? So, so essentially, people that have studied this literature have roughly suggested two hypotheses for why vouchers might work. The first hypothesis has to do with a productive effect. So a productive effect, we call it a productive effect generically, but a productive effect could be multiple things. It could be, for example, that there's better resources in the school, so the instruction is better. The learning environment is better. Okay, anything that just improves your learning directly. Okay, it could it could also be that I remember this a very famous cartoon in the New Yorker, um, kind of like advocating for vouchers, which is Mom, Mom, I want to go to circus school. Okay, it could be a better a better alignment between what the kid wants to learn and and the focus of the school. So you know that autonomy could be important. So anything that like you want to think that it's a direct effect on what kids learn, that has nothing to do with the context of the students in which the, in which the kid is immersed. Okay. Anybody in Colombia have studied uh, qualitatively anything related to this, like the quality of the teachers? The so so we we did that. We, so so I'll tell you I'll tell you like how we tried to disentangle this too because we did an extensive school survey in a sample of participating schools and, and uh, I do not have the tables here but, I, but I'll talk you through the, what we found. That, that was like our, our previous paper on, 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 this, on this voucher program. And, and then the other effect is the peer effect which is 
It has nothing to do with how much effort you devote. It has nothing to do with the, orient the academic orientation or the school environment in terms of infrastructure or teachers. It's just who goes to the school with you, okay? Peer. And so the problem is that depending on which of these channels is at work, as I was explaining before, the general versus partial equilibrium effects could be very different. So suppose it's a productive effect. Okay? Suppose that because students win the voucher and they have an incentive to work harder in school because if, if they don't work hard, they might fail a grade and if, if they fail a grade, they lose the voucher. Then if that's the mechanism by, by which the program works, then you can just impose that restriction on anyone who wins the voucher. Okay? And, if, and, and then the incentive is, is, is at the personal level, and so you could potentially get everyone to work harder in school. Okay? But suppose, on the other hand, that the effect is a redistributive effect. So it means that, suppose we all have the same preferences of starting with more academically inclined peers, say like you know, Tatiana and Morgan are the superstars in our school district, okay? And so we all want to study with, with Tatiana and with Morgan, okay? But if we, if, if only us here on this side of the room get a, get a chance to study with Tatiana and Morgan, then you guys there lose, because you don't get Tatiana and Morgan, even though we, get, we might get you know, whatever other resources. And conversely, if you get to, to study with Tatiana and Morgan, then we lose out, because we don't get them. And it doesn't necessarily need to be that because they're the superstars, then then like we learn, we copy their homework or we go and study with them. It could very well mean that because they're superstars, teachers tailor the curriculum to the needs of these students. And then it's beneficial for you to like be with students that are slightly better than you because because then you know like they push you to learn a little bit harder. Okay, so we we, we don't like you know like why not like wet too much to either of those interpretations, but essentially either because it's good to be with Morgan and Tatiana per se, or because where Morgan and Tatiana are has an impact on, on the instruction and the, and the, and the learning culture, um, we, we think of that as, as peer effects, okay? And so, so essentially, to disentangle these two hypotheses, what we did was we took advantage of the fact that students in Colombia had to apply and be accepted at a school that accepted the voucher before they do their lottery status. So in some sense, the school you go to is orthogonal to the voucher. It's kind of like a pre-treatment characteristic of the student, which is not the case in many of the programs here where you have to choose the school once you know whether you win or not. Okay? So we looked at a subset of schools, in particular vocational schools, and students that had applied to a vocational school were much more likely to go to a vocational school and among this subset of vocational schools, um, well, so for all the schools, we did a survey, a school survey asking things like, you know, average teacher experience, average teacher um, credentials, school environment, what fraction of schools go on to college, like a very extensive, think of it as like a school and staffing survey, what, what you we actually follow the, the model of the school and staffing survey. Did this, was, this was post, we did this survey in 2006. Do you, do you think that, that those things, are, yeah, yeah that, that's the assumption. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so if anything, what we found among, among applicants to vocational schools was that voucher winners were less likely to go to schools with more desirable peer characteristics. So in particular, voucher winners amongst applicants to vocational schools were less likely to have, you know, had a, fra a slightly lower fraction of, of students go graduating from high school, um, going on to college, uh, lower uh, on average college entry tests, and about, you know, like a bunch of different dimensions related to school infrastructure and so forth. So, so if anything, that tells us that amongst the, sam the, the, the population of applicants to vocational schools, voucher winners did not go to school with better peers, okay? at least by measured by this 
observable characteristics. And even so, amongst the, 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 the group of vocational school applicants, we find very strong voucher effects. Okay? So it could not be the case that the voucher effects are only driven by being with better peers. Because if it was only driven by be being with better peers, then we wouldn't have observed any voucher effect in this, in this applicant population. But the, vouchers, the voucher effects were, if anything, stronger than vouchers, than the voucher effects among applicants to, 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 sorry, to academic schools. What about teachers? Because you would expect that the people, the teachers from the public school were from a syndicato, from a union, and like... So that's, 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 that's important, that's, that's, that's important, and I'll explain why that's the case. Um, so, okay, so we rule out the, the redistributive effect. So, what was it then? And so, we argue that there's two hypotheses for why, um, in the Colombia context, the vouchers were affected. One is the incentive effect attached, in, attached to, to not failing a grade. And two was that amongst vocational school applicants, there was a very difference, uh, a very big difference in the curricular focus and the teaching composition of private vocational versus public vocational schools. Okay? So for example, private vocational schools were much more likely to have a commercial curriculum as opposed to, to public vocational schools which were which were more much more oriented to an industrial curriculum. Okay? So this is this is basically the schools are typically targeted um, their, their last two years are focused on teaching skills that are useful in the labor market. And so, so industrial schools basically teach people how to like become welders or be part of like manufacturing companies, uh, inline production, things like this. Commercial schools have a focus on accounting, uh, computing, uh, uh, service interactions, attention to the clients, and so on and so forth. Okay? Uh, public, public vocational schools are much more likely to have an industrial sort of curriculum teacher than, than private vocational schools. And conversely, private vocational schools are much more likely to have commercially oriented teachers. Um, where they do their, um, their summer internships is very different. In, in, in uh, public vocational schools, uh, students typically do their internship in, uh, in El Sena, which is like a national job training agency. Whereas uh, vocational students in public in private vocational schools are much more likely to do their internship in, in private sector companies. Okay? So all this to say that private vocational schools, because they're not um, bound by any sort of teacher union contracts or hiring, are much more nimble. They have much more flexibility in who they hire, who they fire, and how they orient their curriculum in ways that public schools are not. And that basically gives them much more flexibility to adapt to whatever the labor market is demanding. And, and, and so that, that, basically that alignment, just to finish the thought, that alignment between, um, between um, the sort of like the curriculum and potential labor, you know, potential returns to the education in terms of the likelihood of you finding a job is much more attractive in a private vocational school than in a public vocational school. So that the you know a one out ten circus school sort of story. Okay? It's much more pertinent to what what might be a relevant position in the labor market, especially for people that do not go on to to college. So it's like that most of the high schools that these that these kids attended were vocational? About about so I don't know if the high schools, but if you look at applicants, roughly Half of the applicants in our sample had applied to vocational schools. Yes, and and vocational schools were overrepresented amongst the participating schools in the program relative to, for example, academic schools. How big is vocational schools in Colombia relative to the more academic curriculum? Um, if you take if you take for example all schools, private and public, it's about. 70, 30, 70% 70 academic, 30% vocational. Yeah, so this is kind of showing us that the effects of passes was kind of like very unexpected because it seems like it's kind of like directing kids to mm. 
vocational and they Well, I wouldn't say so because, first of all, you, we are comparing applicants to vocational schools that went to private vocational versus public vocational. It's not we're comparing academic versus, That's right. That's right. versus vocational. Uh, so all the comparisons are within type of within the type of school that, that, that students had applied to, and that's in some sense orthogonal to, to whether or not you win the lottery. So, so, so it's not really comparing. Um, it's not perfect, but there's still a minority, so that's why it's difficult to think that the effect is, is mostly driven by them, given that they're only one child. No, I mean, it's not, I, I don't want to say that it's mostly driven by them, because we do observe the same magnitude and significance of effects amongst applicants to academic schools. But, but in academic schools, there is a difference in peer and you know, observable characteristics between the schools that voucher winners go and vouchers and voucher losers go to. So, so with, for them, we cannot disentangle the productive versus the redistributive effect because they go together. It's only amongst applicants to vocational schools that we see that there's no difference in peer characteristics and we still see voucher effects, okay. which suggests that it cannot only be the peer story. And so to sum up, what the story that we're that we're thinking of is is you know it's the incentive plus the you know the alignment of, of the of the curricular focus of, of private schools which which is much more flexible because they don't have to be bound by you know teachers unions or like it's much easier to hire and fire teachers and so forth. And so if we were gonna think about expanding a program like this, because much much of the, the voucher program initiatives with the exception of Chile are very small scale programs. Okay, and so in many countries, in Colombia, for example, there is scope in, only in Bogota about 25% of total secondary enrollment is contracted out to private schools. It's not contracted out to, through a voucher system, which means that students are not allowed to, to choose which school they want to go to. They're just assigned to go to a school that's closest to their house. So you could think, for example, that you could expand the coverage of voucher programs to you know, like to, to, to reach the limit, if you thought of the program, if you design the program meeting at least three conditions, and this is you know it's more speculative, but it's based on like you know the characteristics of the different programs around the world, that and, and you know, looking you know like kind of like meta-analyzing in a non-rigorous way the effects of the different programs. And so you want typically programs that are targeted to low-income students are more effective than programs that like just that everyone uses a voucher. So you might want to target the program to low-income students. Um, the other thing is you, you might want to like um, not let, so in Chile what happens is that schools <coughs> are able to choose which students they receive. So what that means that schools end up competing for their, on, on their selectivity rather than, their, than on their value added. Okay? So, so, so the advantage of the Columbia setting is that the schools had, well the students had to apply and be accepted but it means that that um, that the schools couldn't like exactly select which students they wanted to receive or not. Okay, so they're really not competing in terms of selectivity; they're competing potentially in terms of value added. So, so you know, like a system that has open enrollment that is not selective and the participating schools are non-selective, usually is better than the Chilean system in which you have selected schools and, and, and schools competing on their reputation and not on their, their reputation by selectivity and not reputation by by value added. And then, and then typically, um, you know, for example, the, the DC scholarship program, the, 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 the last evaluation, that, that program also has like a conditionality. Um, in, uh, so students have to work hard. So there's like a, a good, you have students have to be in good standing in private schools in order to retain their voucher. And so in that, in that program, we also see higher high school graduation rates, which is consistent with the effect we saw in Colombia. So, so we think that, you know, the incentive component is also to having you know, some bias in, in exerting effort um, on the part of the students. Okay. Any, any additional questions or comments? Or? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm sorry if you already answered this question, but I, I don't really know the answer to it. Um, do you know what happens to those students who didn't get in? Or who didn't get a voucher? Because because Columbia set this program up because they didn't have enough capacity in uh -huh. the public sector, yeah. right? So what happens to those students who couldn't get the voucher? Who maybe uh -huh. gotten into the category? yeah? So so it, they follow different paths. About fifty percent of those 
about 30% of those who did not win a voucher ended up going to, to a, a private secondary school. And, and then the remaining went to, to a public secondary school. Yeah. Could you compare those who went to the private, those who still pay the, the, the full tuition, and those who received the voucher? Because I, I'm wondering um, if the, the if, if part of the reason for some differences might have been parents had to buy into this, buy into the, their their students' education in both circumstances, uh -huh. right? And I wonder if that played into uh, an effect that you know allowed you know more positive effects for the students with vouchers because you know their parents still had to pay half the tuition, right? So you're thinking part of the incentive might come, well, now we're paying for your education, you better graduate. It's buy it, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's possible that the incentive is also playing through the, through the cost aspect. Okay. Right, and so I, that's why I thought maybe comparing those students who did not get the voucher, but still went to pop the, to, to the, the, the problem is that that comparison is not causal. Okay. Because, because whether you should, what's causal is whether you were assigned a voucher or not. Right. But within assignment, People that choose to use the voucher and go to private school versus those that don't um, could be different for many reasons. Their okay. willingness to pay right. and many characteristics that we don't necessarily observe. So it's not a clean comparison. We could do it just yeah. to get a sense of how are, how are they different? Are they you know, more better off than, than you know, the typical applicant? Um, and, and that's something we could definitely do and, and should do. But, but it doesn't get, get a sense of, of whether that's the mediated mechanism because because it's not there could be other omitted factors that you're not taking into account. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I was wondering too, do you have information on like siblings versus siblings in it or family dynamics? So I wonder households come into play if you have more than one student that you want to make. Um, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. We, 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 we know if they had a they had a sibling, but we did not follow we don't have identifying sibling information. So it would be hard to it would be super interesting to see if there's like siblings below or things like that. Or is that is that what you're thinking? Yeah, in, in just the how you clump their groups so determined if they were if the control and the treatment groups were similar in that sense and, and who dropped out of the study. In in terms of I'm sorry, I'm probably not articulating this correctly, but um, just in terms of who ends up dropping out when they don't get a hundred percent of I see. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 a good point. You know, it would give more substance to like what's who, who are the people that are persisting through through the high the end of high school graduation, for example. And, and one story for why they they don't persist is the voucher stops paying full tuition, you know, and then you have siblings, and then you know there's some sort of like sibling preference, or you have to split the cost, and so then then you you, you can't continue going on to private school. So when we look at rate of return in Colombia for a student who is a high school graduate, they would pay how much more? Do you have any sense? I'm just trying to see if this is so. Really so ten percent is roughly the you know in a non-causal sense. Exactly. The Minsarian return to our additional year of education. Does that make so, sense? So but I'm just, I'm just trying to say, so this is the story that I'm kind of like getting is like, okay, it seems like these specific voucher programs in Colombia was very cost effective for the government, which mm -hmm. is not surprising because before they were like paying all the costs and now they're sending half of the cost to the family. So obviously that's like for the government, they're going to be paid less. And you're also saying, okay, it, has, it also has like social returns because these individuals are also more likely to be employed and earning more. Well, so the, so the social returns, in, in what we're assuming is that there's no externality. So the, the private returns are the social returns, mm -hmm. okay? And then and then the other thing is, um, even if we took into account the private cost as a government cost, you know, it, it doesn't matter who pays for it. It's still very cost effective. So suppose 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 that you were going to say that from the government perspective that you don't want any. Uh, you know, if you don't want families to pay anything out of pocket. So 
but you could you would just basically double the amount of the voucher, and it means that it, that those you know like say like fifty dollars per year that you have to pay on on private education, you don't split it half and half. You just pay for all of it. It still means that the relative to the co the, the, the public cost, if you include waste and you include you know the opportunity cost of some other students attending public school, it's still very cost effective. Just taking into account, the, the, assuming the private returns are the social returns. It would be interesting to see because, like, I still think the fact that the parents have to pay, and, and this is something that they have to do every year, uh -huh. is, is different. So, if you keep finding the same thing, if the parents don't have to pay anything, like, that would be like, really, really interesting. Also, you're thinking you're thinking of a potential manipulation of, of the share that, like, like the cost share. That students that, that families have to pay. Um, that I mean that's that's a very relevant question in you know public finance and, and you know international aid settings, uh, which is which is um, what's better to give things for free or have people cost share. And so the best available evidence is is an experimental setting in in um, in Kenya with uh, with uh, insecticide treated mosquito nets. And so, so a researcher who was at UCLA and, and is now at Stanford basically did this experiment in which for some groups of families, they gave the nets for free. And for some groups of families, they gave the nets at a discount, but the, fam the, the families had to pay for, for, for an extra you know, 10 cents of the so There was a discount, but, but they had to pay some. And so you would wonder, first of all, if you get it for free, are you going to buy it afterwards, or do you get used to getting it for free? Do you discourage future purchases? And so what she finds is that the, the likelihood of using it is the same in both, in both whether you pay or, or whether you get it for free. And the likelihood of returning then to buy another one is the same for both, for, for both groups. So it means that, that you know, getting it, you know, the cost sharing is, is, isn't necessarily more effective than than giving it for free. People, people, people don't get used to getting things for free. People get used to things that work. So if they see, so that analogy, extrapolating the context, if you were going to take those findings into this, into the, this voucher, voucher setting, would imply that um, it's not that if you get the voucher for free, you get used to going to a private school for free. It means if the voucher allows you to go to a school where the quality is good enough then you get used to like the higher quality and then you're happy to like either get it for free or potentially have to shell out a little bit of money uh, to pay for it. Okay, so So, so the, the first thing that's very interesting is that Colombia eliminated this voucher program in the, in, at the end of, of the 1990s, in 1998, 1999. And the reason why they did that was the program lost credibility because the government was delayed in paying the schools. And so the schools that depended on the voucher revenue you know, were less, like, basically had to close and that, that meant like there were less options for parents to choose and so that just unraveled into, into a lot of credibility. There was also opposition, of course, from, from teachers unions because, because it's, you know, like, providing, uh, you know, it's, it's public financing of private education and, you know, teacher unions by nature like pro public provision. So, so, so it ended. And so, so you know, when I, when I presented the results there, they're like, oh, wow. I mean, it would be really interesting if, if, if the people that close the program saw these results because, because you know, it seems like this is a really good investment and there's scope to do it, but it's politically difficult. Because, and the reason why it's politically difficult is not because, well, one dimension which is politically difficult is, is um, financing private education with public funds. Okay? Although, from a public finance perspective, that's, that's you know, equivalent to public provision in, in terms of like, you know, a dollar is a dollar. 
uh, it could even be cheaper, but but uh, but it has the political consequence of, of dealing with teachers' unions, okay, and their, the stability of their jobs and so forth. But on the other hand, it has to do with the fact that um, that uh, it's very hard, you know. Like ideally, the the way this like competition in the education model works is that you know the students that go to private schools benefit from a better education, but also there's an incentive for public schools to ex improve the quality of their education because if they don't improve, all the students are gonna leave to the private system and then the school is gonna have to close. And so what I think is difficult is to allow public schools to fail. It's, it's, it, I think that's, you know, although that's how like the, the whole like model of competition, lifting all boats, the one with the private and the public works, I think it's in practice to let public schools fail and so, so one of the arguments that someone who, who was from the government was advocating was, yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, but, but it could very well be the case that in the end we end up doubling expenditures in education because we have to pay for the students that go to the private system and we have to keep paying for public schools instead of like, you know, letting the public schools fail and transferring those costs into vouchers to, to, for students who attend private education. So just, I'm just curious what's like the, the Colombian government right now in terms of that debate. Like so, so um, I mean, the, the person that I talked to was the Vice Minister of Education in, in the previous government, and they said there's definitely scope for doing it because, as I said, there's not enough capacity in the, in, in public schools to to meet all the demand. So they're having to contract out with private schools. And so the, the thing is that they're doing it like, you know, by, by, you know, by, by a central planning system. So these kids live here, they go to the school. These kids live here, they go to the school. And so you could do the same thing, and that's about 25% of total enrollment in Bogota, by just letting them choose. You can have a voucher system, you can even do it by a lottery, and then you, know, you will end up meeting 25% of, of demand in, in, in private school, but you would just, the allocation would be different. It would be decentralized instead, instead of like from a central planning perspective. Thank you. Thank you.